Welcome back to another review by Elaine, because I have opinions. Today we're going to talk about Empire of Sand by Tasha Suri. So I'm going to start by saying I picked up this book specifically because I was looking for a comp for something I'm trying to query right now. And what I told people was I was looking for something that has a strong female lead, a good bit of fights, and a matter-of-fact tone. That's not what this is. The only element of those three that it has is the strong female lead. But I still really like the book, so it's not like I'm mad about it. Uh, but Empire of Sand is the story of Mare. And I'm going to pause here and say I'm going to mispronounce every single name in this. I don't know how to pronounce any of it. Just please excuse me. Uh, but Mare is a woman who is born of two very different bloodlines. Her father is the governor of the province, a member of the Abhan ruling class. Her mother, on the other hand, was Amarithi. Uh, they are a desert people who have been displaced and almost entirely wiped out by the Abhan Empire. Mare's mother started this relationship with her father, gave birth to Mare and her younger sister, and then just disappeared out in the desert so long ago that Mare's younger sister barely remembers her mother. But Mare is determined to keep her mother's memory and culture alive. She practices a lot of the rites of the Emirithi within the protective walls of her father's manor. Until a storm comes. There are these storms in this world of what is called dream fire. And dream fire is literally physical embodiment, basically, of dreams of the gods that sleep under the desert. Uh, it's seen as sort of like a combination of sandstorm and like free-floating magic in the air. And it can be used to completely reshape reality. And the Amrithi had rights to interact with this dream fire. They considered it sacred. But Mir, when the storm reaches her city, which is rare because she lives far enough out of the desert that they don't usually reach that far, but when a storm does reach her city, she finds herself out in it, desperately calling on the gods to help her. And this attracts the attention of the Maha, the immortal head of the Abhan religion. He sends his mystics to force her to marry one of them and bring her back to their temple at the center of the desert, where she will learn exactly how rotten the core of the Abham Empire is. Okay, so I'm going to get this out of the way first. There is a threat of sexual violence that looms over over half of this book. Mare is forced into marriage, and the consummation of that marriage is a major part of the danger that she lives through. But... I do think it's handled well, and huge spoilers here, it's not a threat that is ever followed through with. There is sex, and consent is still... I mean, it's not quite what's going on in that scene, but this is not an act of violence. It is an act of sex between two people who love each other and want to be with each other. It's just the situation makes them not happy with it happening. But... Uh, but this overall means that if you are someone who is going to be hurt by reading 200 pages with looming sexual violence threatening always, maybe skip this book. But overall, I loved the book. Uh, so a couple of reviews ago, I talked about Tahanu and about how a lot of the themes in that book felt outdated because it was still having the debate of whether a woman has to take on masculine roles and traits to be strong. But this book doesn't. Mare is very feminine. She inhabits a feminine position in society. She fulfills feminine roles, has feminine desires, and femi traditionally for feminine traits. And none of it is presented as weak. She doesn't have to shuck off the pretty fancy clothes and veils and don armor because she sees that the silk dresses and veils are armor. Uh, she doesn't learn to fight, but when faced with a man with a sword, she is still the one with all the power. And it's not one of those books that's like, oh, this is the one way to be a woman. 
no, there are plenty of other examples of womanhood within the book. There are female guards, female fighters, and women in high positions in society. Now, this is a highly gendered world that Mare lives in, and Mare is sheltered and objectified by her society, but it's very clear that it's a cultural thing and not like a woman thing. The Amrithi don't treat women like they are possessions, but the Abham do. Uh, and it's not ever set up as a cut and dry, clear, like, oh, look at this society being wrong for doing this. It's more nuanced than that. Even within the Abham culture, where women are seen as possessions, we see women holding power and how they can use that power. Uh, also, there is none of the, I'm a strong female character in a patriarchal society, I have to bitch about corsets, and how I don't want to be like all those other girls. When Mare mourns her lack of power, which she does, yes, it is almost always about the cultural chains that hold her, and those cultural chains hold the men around her, too. And, yeah, that brings us to the one of the major themes in this book. This book is about racism. Turns out a lot of them are. Uh, there is a magic in Mare's bloodline, but it's also a bloodline that gives her darker skin and features that are recognizably different from those around her. And that puts Mare in danger. The Abham are committing genocide against the Amrithi. They're slaughtering them, they're running them out of their homes, they're destroying their ways of life. Even while building the entire Abham empire, on the magic that runs in Amrithi blood. And I think the book handles this really heavy topic really well. And part of that comes from the fact that the big bad, the man that started this entire genocide, is both a complete monster and intensely human. The author makes a point of showing us how he became this monster in the first place, that he came to be this person out of a selfish love and desire to protect what he had built. Uh, this is also a beautifully realized magic system. There is a lot going on with dreamfire, gods, deva, rites, prayers, and the magic of the Amrithi, but it all works together and weaves into one tapestry. Nothing feels tacked on, and I understood what was going on, even though the core is built off of an Indian mythology which I am significantly less familiar with. Uh, maybe because of that, and maybe just because Tasha Suri wrote a damn good book, some of the twists and turns of the plot actually really surprised me. And I do like to see that. I like a book that manages to take me off guard. Uh, I will say it was a very emotional read, but one that pulled me on, made me wanting to keep reading. I struggled to put it down at the end of the night, and to me, that's the biggest compliment a book can get.